Item number, SCP-10. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. The objects comprising SCP-10 are to be kept in numbered locked boxes in a high security facility. They are not to be worn except by test subjects. SCP-10 are only to be removed from storage for testing. Description. SCP-10 consists of a series of six apparently identical cast iron collars with numbered metal tags and one remote control. The control is SCP-10-1. The collars are SCP-10-2 through 10-7. The collars contain intricate electronic components and are powered by small, 5mm in diameter, 2mm thick, 100 volt batteries. These batteries are rechargeable. The remote is a heavy black box, resembling an old style handheld radio transmitter receiver with a primitive blue and white cathode ray screen and a series of more than 100 unlabeled buttons, as well as a frequency tuner. Through trial and error, the frequencies of all six currently found collars have been discovered. A label in Russian is stamped into the metal, along with a logo consisting of workers building a pyramid. No official Russian corporation or government agency uses this logo, or matches the words stamped into the metal. Placing the collar around the neck of a person and securing it allows one to control their every movement with the remote. It is also capable of producing an adrenal response and activating or deactivating the sympathetic nervous system. The most abnormal feature of the collars is the effect they have on the body morphology. They allow the user of the remote to reconfigure the shape of the victim to an extent that is apparently only limited by the knowledge of the programming language of the remote. Addendum 10-1 History SCP-10 was discovered in the basement of a lone man in the Midwestern United States after a local disappearance was connected to him. When the police raided the man's house, they found SCP-10 as well as several dead bodies. One of the bodies was identified to be the man. The others were several other missing persons. Cause of death seemed to be mass suicide. However, there were signs of significant struggle first. Addendum 10-2 Disassemble experiment. Test 1. SCP-10-2 taken apart piecewise, the parts labeled and several photographs taken, then reassembled. Result. After reassembly, SCP-10-2 continues to function. Test 2. SCP-10-8 constructed identically to SCP-10-2, but with the closest approximations available to the unreplicable components. Result. SCP-10-8 fails to function. Test 3. Unreplicable components from SCP-10-2 placed into proper locations on SCP-10-8. Result. SCP-10-2 ceases functioning with removal of components. SCP-10-8 begins functioning. Test 4. Components return to SCP-10-2. Replicable components in SCP-10-2 replaced randomly with replicas. Result: SCP-10-2 begins functioning with return of components. Changing replicable components for replicas does not significantly reduce functionality. Replacement of a damaged transistor decreased time from transmission to effect of SCP-10-2, response to commands entered in the remote, by 12%. Addendum 10-3 SCP-10 has been demonstrated to work more effectively in creating unskilled labor than for any other task. The logo is apt. Dr. Item number, SCP-13. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-13 are to be kept in a secure storage vault at Site-66. Exposed subjects are to be monitored for differences between their symptoms. Exposed subjects are to be interviewed daily and any changes in perception are to be logged. Description SCP-13 is the collective designation of 242 cigarettes, which display similar anomalies. The most common external detail between instances is the presence of the words Blue Lady, handwritten on each cigarette in blue ink. Subjects who consume the contents of SCP-13 through inhalation will begin to perceive themselves as a specific unidentified woman. Subjects have described the woman to be aged between 25 and 35 years old, standing approximately 1.6 meters tall, with an estimated weight of between 50 and 55 kilograms. 
Additional recurring details include cropped dark hair, blue eyes, and bright blue lipstick. Immediately after consuming an instance of SCP-13, subjects will gradually begin to perceive reflections of themselves as having the features of the woman, and will gradually perceive their bodies changing to reflect her appearance over the course of the following weeks. All changes are entirely mental. The subject's body does not change outwardly, only their perception of themselves. These alterations are permanent and cannot be reversed. SCP-13 was discovered after the suicide of an Ian Miles, packed in a large cardboard crate in his apartment. A cursory search of the apartment uncovered several hundred sketches of a figure strongly resembling the one perceived while under 13's effect. Miles's body had been found sitting at a desk, dead of a massive overdose, and draped over a handwritten note. During the investigation of Miles's apartment, one civilian investigator became affected by 13's effect. An embedded agent soon contacted the nearest site. The subject, the artifact, and related evidence were extracted and contained. Currently, 217 instances of SCP-13 cigarettes are contained at Biosite 66. 25 SCP-13 cigarettes are contained at Research Sector 9, pending future research into similar anomalous effects. Addendum. Below is the note which was acquired along with SCP-13. I see her everywhere, that sad blue lady. I feel like I used to, should, do know her, but I can't remember. I love her, but I don't know why. She's so beautiful and sweet and clear, but I don't know anymore. Her favorite flavor, where did you go? I miss you. Item number. SCP-064 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-064 is to be kept in a suitably remote area for observation. Current goals are to generate a geometric model of the object's behavioral pattern and to observe any changes in this pattern due to location and soil composition. Certain sites in the Gobi Desert and Australian Outback, as well as a number of salt flats scattered around the globe, are under consideration for future testing. SCP-064's current location is classified to all personnel under security clearance level 3. Once growth has stopped, field teams are to document the structure's size, shape, and composition, and remove the object for transport to a new site. Description: SCP-064 is a light brown earthenware brick, composed primarily of silicon oxides and some organic matter. The object weighs 1.6 kilograms and measures some 10 centimeters by 6 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Its surface is smooth and flat, with some minor cosmetic chips. By and large, the object is visually similar to most solid bricks used in construction. When left lying on a flat expanse of soft earth, SCP-064 will begin to multiply through an unknown mechanism. Close observation reveals the appearance of an irregular lattice of silicone fibers in the shape of the original object, which then fills and solidifies with a soil-based mixture until it attains the proper mass. This process may be similar to mycelial propagation in fungi, with microscopic root structures mining minerals from soil in the immediate vicinity. Under optimal conditions, soil composition at roughly 90% silicon dioxide, it takes approximately 70 minutes for one complete brick to appear. Given a large expanse of earth to work with, SCP-064 produces a highly complex but theoretically stable freestanding brick structure, including floors and ceilings. Past observations indicate that the structure could attain the shape of a 12-pointed star, over 10 kilometers in diameter and of considerable height. However, this is speculative, as growth stops permanently once the structure contacts a significant obstacle, observed to include any solid object over 10 kilograms in mass. Structural integrity is very high as bricks orient themselves to be as level as possible and fit together almost perfectly. Interestingly, the structure's growth is tailored to a specific set of cardinal directions, with SCP-064 always being the northernmost brick on the lowest level. SCP-064 must be attached for growth to occur. Once SCP-064 is removed, the structure begins to decay and all secondary bricks crumble to dust at a rate roughly equal to their rate of appearance. Replacing the object within 20 minutes halts this decay, 
and allows growth to continue. Past this threshold, the process is irreversible. SCP-064 was found by chance in April of 2000 during satellite observation of an elevated plateau in the Andes Mountains. A camera operator noted that one structure was apparently growing, extrapolating the object's approximate location from the structure's apparent direction of growth, which stopped during recovery. Field teams located the object by differences in color between SCP-064 and its secondary bricks, which were high in iron oxides from the local soil. A full excavation of the original site is underway in order to ascertain the object's cultural and technological origins. Item Number SCP-090 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Artifact is to be held in a secure bunker in the facility at Site and constantly monitored by approved Class D personnel. The object's new arrangement is to be imaged every time it shifts. New arrangements are fed into the facility's Class OT supercomputer. Division Chief is to be notified of all changes and current estimates every half hour. No personnel is to touch SCP-090, except under order undisclosed. AXA security level has been created for monitoring SCP-090. Non-AXA personnel found in the facility will be terminated. Description SCP-090 was located and retrieved in an undisclosed location on April 10th, 19... Prior to retrieval, SCP-090 had been located in a chamber at the nearby cathedral. SCP-090 was removed. The cathedral burned. Six monks and the priest were terminated. SCP-090 has been located at site since the retrieval. Object's initial location prior to the cathedral is unrecorded. SCP-090 is a black cubic structure, 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, made of an unknown ceramic material. Object is classified as indestructible following tests outlined in Document 090-B, unattached. Each side is divided into 10,000 individual squares, in arrangements similar to a Rubik's Cube, 100 segments per edge, each segment 2 millimeters wide. Each square has part of a design etched into the surface. Etchings glow white. Unknown internal structure causes the realignment of a single row or column roughly every 2.8 seconds. Vague records of the object's alignments have been kept since 1242 CE, but those kept before 1533 CE have been lost. Modern technology has allowed the exact alignments to be imaged and recorded, as well as studied. Segments are divided by a thin white line, unless they are aligned correctly with the square directly adjacent to them. There are 22 correct alignments on the object's surface currently. D023016 is currently the only alignment of three adjacent segments on the surface of SCP-090. B100023 and C043077 are the four-segment alignments. There is also a six-segment alignment. Full item completion has been hypothesized to cause an unparalleled disaster to occur. Addendum Document 090-A Dr. Experiment Notes Experiment 0012 Observation is going well. We have managed to develop a system to record and analyze the shifts in the cube almost as quickly as they occur. No correlation between shifts and any world events found yet. Experiment 0048 We observed a six-segment alignment today on the first side. It was noted and passed without incident. Two hours later, a research assistant returned from the break room with news that a tsunami had occurred in the Indian Ocean and caused hundreds of thousands of deaths and extensive property damage. No correlation is currently known, but we will make note of it. Experiment 0150 After our 112th alignment on the fourth side of the cube and 120th accident report in the lab, we are designating the fourth side as local and will implement safety measures tomorrow. Staff are discouraged from making bets regarding the outcome of alignments. Experiment 0172 a six-segment alignment was recorded this morning on the local side. As a safety precaution, Site was evacuated. Two hours later, a containment breach occurred, but resulted in no loss of life due to the evacuation. Object determined to predict events, not cause them. First side designated as global. 
Upgrade to Euclid's status requested. Experiment 0240. We stepped up our experiments today by attempting to modify the cube itself. When D-Class personnel attempted to make a shift, SCP-090 immediately created a 10-segment alignment of its own accord near the top left corner of the local side. Exactly two hours later, SCP broke containment and data expunged. Two agents were also lost during the incident. Recommended forced shift testing of SCP-090 postponed. Upgrade to Keter status approved, as SCP-090 is obviously capable of causing events of its own accord. Object may be sentient. SCP-093-T2 Mirror Tests Testing Protocols Subjects testing SCP-093 must wear a Class 3 buckle harness strapped to the chest and attached to a tension pulley system, allowing for 300 meters or roughly 1,000 feet of movement. Additional spools may be added to extend movement if necessary. The clasps connecting these spools must be high grade and capable of withstanding applied force of 0.2 tons. A field kit containing the following should be standard issue for testing of SCP-093. 1. Wrist-mounted light source with 3 hours lifespan and additional power sources providing up to 6 additional hours. 4. 0.5 liter water bottles with water. 4 MREs of any type, plus 2 plain granola bars. Chocolate chips allowed. 1. Standard issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 24 rounds of ammunition loaded. This is not to be issued until subject has passed into a mirror using SCP-093 and should be given under armed supervision, ensuring that the subject passes through entirely. This item is to be requisitioned first upon subject's return, and subject to be made aware of this before leaving line of sight within SCP-093's mirror. One standard issue field knife. The subject is not to be made aware of this item, and must find it on his own within the kit. The subject must also be attached to a video system, with the camera mounted on the subject's head or shoulders. The video device should be cable-based and allow for the same length of travel as the return system. Wireless cameras have shown mixed results and should only be used in testing conditions, where SCP-093 is a currently known color. New colors must be tested using wired feed. During testing, the color of SCP-093 must be recorded as well as history of the subject in terms of their incarceration to identify how SCP-093 determines the color to assume. A link appears to be connected to guilt, or a lack thereof, in the subject's psyche. The attached test results should be read in order. Mirror Test 1. Color, Blue. Subject is D-20384, male, 34 years of age, strong physique. Subject's background shows instance of murder and attempted suicide. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a blue color. Outside, technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to an outdoor landscape, heavily tinged in blue. Video feed follows an attached media. Camera activates flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same field reported by technicians. Looks like typical lowland plains. Everything has a heavy blue tinge overlapping the normal colors. No discernible landmarks visible as subject pans view left to right. Only grass, weeds, and a breeze moving the taller grass. No trees. No living beings visible. Subject moves forward as instructed, traveling for approximately 500 steps before something becomes visible, a patch of the land up ahead is barren, and grass can be seen dying as subject approaches it. Approximately 300 steps forward, subject is standing before a hole in the ground. The hole has been dug using unknown tools of primitive origin. Pulley system engaged, and the camera suffers a light shutter. Subject is instructed to enter the hole, and after mild protesting, agrees to do so. There is no apparent method of descent such as ladder or rope. Subject relies entirely on his own hands and the pulley system to slow the descent. Approximately 100 meters of cable is used before a bottom is reached. Light source provided in field kit activated 50 meters down when outside sources become unreliable. 
Sweeping gestures of the light reveal nothing more than dirt, even at the bottom of the hole. Subject moves forward with assistance of light source. Asked about the blue tinge, Subject expresses confusion and says there is no such tinge from his perspective, and never was. Light is visible down the passage, and 150 meters of cable has been used. Out of the camera's eye, sound is recorded of the firearm being prepared. When questioned about these actions, Subject states justified precaution and moves forward. The tunnel turns from bare dirt to a concrete enclosure. Subject complains of a stench. The light source is revealed to be sealing light fixtures, a series of which with less than a quarter broken, while the others function. A series of six doors, three to a side, span before the camera view, with a seventh door visible at the end of the corridor that has been blocked by what looks like generic metal shelving debris. Debris shows signs of rusting and is typical of retail store units, suggesting other human presences. Subject requested to try doors in whatever order he chooses. Subject tries first door on the right. Door is locked, does not open. Second door tries to open but does not budge. Unlocked, but blocked. Closing second door. Third door is tried. Same results as first. Going up the other side, the third door does open fully, and the light is bright in the room. Portable light switched off at this time as subject pans camera to inspect room. Room is bare, no contents, but walls are filthy. Subject states material on walls isn't dirt, but he can't identify it. Seems to resemble melted plastic, but is brown in color rather than black. Door is closed. Second door on left side has no handle, does not move when pushed. The hole where the handle was is plugged by unknown material. All doors are shaped in such a way that nothing can visibly escape from the sides, and space for movement is too thin to look through, even at ground level. First door on left hand is locked, but part of key is present in lock from stem to the ridges. The back has been broken off. With effort, subject manipulates key to open door and immediately begins coughing, complaining of a stench. Walls of room are clean, as is floor. Ceiling is coated in the same strange brown material as the third room. In this room, there is a makeshift cot made from aged blankets with a pillow, a wooden crate containing open boxes of what appears to have been foodstuffs. Language appears on video as squiggles. However, subject states they simply read cereal. A second crate in the room contains what appears to be empty water bottles that have dried out. A book lays next to the cot, closed, no title or identifying marks. On the wall is what appears to be clipped articles, but language cannot be read. Subject asks to remove clippings for retrieval. All articles but one crumble at the touch due to age. The intact article is put in a field sample container and seems the most recent compared to the others. Asked to investigate the book, subject begins to move toward it. Audio on the tape goes strange, and a high-pitched screeching noise like grinding metal dominates all communication for 3.5 seconds. Subject has not touched the book still, and when the noise stops, subject asks Control to repeat request. Control made no requests during that time as headsets were removed. Subject advised to leave room, and notes that the door has begun closing slowly on its own, and if left alone, will close. Subject advised to leave door alone, and to investigate door on right. Careful review of the following 10 seconds of tape shows that as the camera pans, a figure is visible at the end of the tunnel where the seventh door is. The door is open, only enough for a face to be seen through a crack just before the door silently closes. No details can be seen. Subject investigates the second door on the right with no mention of anything out of the ordinary. This door, when pushed against, moves, and after repeated bashings, moves enough to view inside at an angle. A corkboard is visible with more articles attached to it. The top of a box of cereal can be seen on the floor, and what appears to be a hand laying palm up. Subject closes door and pans camera past door 7, which remains closed. Seeing nowhere else to explore, subject requested to return. Subject poses no protest and complains of ever-increasing stench. As subject returns back down tunnel, his camera feed does not change or show anomaly, but control reports a sudden surge in cable movement, pulling an additional 100 meter of cable through before going slack again and then tightening. 
Video feed shows subject ascending tunnel slowly while control attempts to verify integrity of the pulley system. Subject requested to stop ascent, but states he is not climbing. The rope is pulling him up. Panic sets in on both sides, and subject informed to ready firearm. Upon reaching top of hole, nothing is visible on camera, and subject reports nothing has changed in landscape, then begins a return trip following the path of the cable. Traveling for approximately 900 steps, subject asks how much cable he has used. Control admits they are unsure due to complications, but subject traveled in a straight line to reach the hole, so it should be a straight line back. Subject becomes concerned when he states that more cable is visible now, moving in a 90 degree angle, away from a point in the ground. Subject pans camera around full circle slowly. On film, behind subject, a crowd of 37 countable figures stand silently. Features are unidentifiable, and they are lacking the blue tinge that dominates the landscape. Panic breaks in control again, but subject notes only oddity as being the cable having an angled path. Subject tugs his end of the cable. It is taut and does not move. Control begins to reel in the pulley system, and slack rapidly winds. Watching the angled cable, movement can be seen, as grass is disturbed further down the angled portion from the reeling in. Then the line vibrates, as it meets resistance, and emits a twang from the recoil. Subject's camera pans back a long length of cable, which now appears to slowly be allowing more slack, before suddenly, all slack is returned, and pulley system begins again. Control requests subject return following cable path, and screams are caught on the audio, with panic from subject. Five shots fired as subject aims pistol at something not visible on camera. Control reports being able to see subject returning toward point of origin, while camera shows wire disappearing into a point, floating in the air. As subject passes this point, all cable is now in the pulley system, and camera films only the floor. Control reports that the mirror took approximately five seconds to return to a reflection, and SCP-093 remained blue in color until one hour after being recovered from subject. A vile-smelling fluid was present on subject's clothes around his hands when firearm was recovered. This fluid dried quickly and was deemed insignificant of study due to lack of quality sample. Control personnel monitoring the mirror state having seen a massive human being crawling on the ground, easily 50 times the size of a normal person, with no facial features, and a very short arm reach, pulling itself toward the mirror before it returned to a reflection. Due to proximity, fine details could not be made out, but at least one observer noted the being appeared to have been shot from the marks in the otherwise smooth, featureless face. Field test kit recovered from subject, containing a newspaper article that reads, Data expunged, and was filed as item data expunged. The next test is classified as the green test. Mirror test 2. Color, green. Subject is D54493, female, 23 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows instance of grand theft auto and second degree murder of two children during escape with vehicle. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a green color. Outside, technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a farming landscape, heavily tinged in green, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same farmland reported by technicians. All greens through video feed are deeper, and green tinge overlays the normal colors of objects similar to the blue tinge in Test 1. No landmarks from Test 1 are discernible, as subject pants camera over area. Present is a field, long abandoned, in the middle of which stands the remains of a scarecrow of unknown design. Fragments left are rotted and torn. Nothing grows in the tilled land. A farmhouse is visible to the right of the field, large, two stories. A basement shelter entrance is visible at one end. Subject prepares her sidearm immediately and is asked by control to relax before proceeding, her heavy breathing dominating the audio feed. Subject takes a few minutes and announces that she's fine, 
then proceeds as directed to walk the perimeter of the farmhouse. Children's bicycles, two, a boys and girls, lay against the house near the shelter doors. One of the doors to the shelter lay in the grass, torn from the entrance, as evidenced by splintering wood. On the stairs lay clothes, arranged, in a descending order, shoes to shirt going down them, belonging to a boy. Subject begins screaming at Control, asking if this is some sort of sick joke. Control assures her they have never seen this environment either, and to please calm down. Subject takes several minutes to regain herself before continuing. It is unknown if SCP-093 is linking the subject's past with her landscape. After several minutes, Subject agrees to continue. Communication to Subject is muted, and conversation of Control making commentary about Subject's jittery attitude make up audio for one and a half minutes. Communication restored as Subject reaches bottom of stairs. The cellar of the farmhouse is unremarkable and typical. Several wooden shelves line the far wall containing unidentified canned substances. Broken light fixtures sway gently from support beams. Camera is panned across the basement slowly. No evidence of footprints are visible, and the basement can be assumed to have been abandoned for some time. Subject begins to comment about a stench. As subject pans the area, a metal hatch is visible in the ground, similar to a bulkhead on a submarine with a turn handle. Subject remarks that the smell is at its worst around the hatch, and the dirt around the hatch is noted as being clumped and clay-like. The handle of the hatch is old, and the paint chipped. Subject coerced into turning the handle which, when fully turned, opens the hatch. Subject begins coughing at the release of assumed old, stale air. When camera is tilted to view down the hatch, it is a white concrete tunnel, similar to the one found in the blue experiment, but in much better condition. Subject asks to descend the ladder and close hatch behind her. After some convincing, subject agrees to descend, but does not close the hatch. Overlooked concerns about severing the pulley return system in doing so are acknowledged. Descent down the ladder and trip to the farmhouse has consumed approximately 53 meters of cable when bottom is reached. The inside of the hatch appears to be a bunker, ill-suited to long-term storage. It is spacious, about half the size of the actual cellar itself, containing three bunks, one for a couple and two for single use. Several boxes of food similar to those found during Blue marked as cereal fill a waste container near the hatch bottom. On the beds are two skeletons, and on the floor is a third, lying next to which is a simple six-shooter revolver containing no ammunition. Three spent casings are across the floor near the gun. On the other side of this skeleton is a bound book in good condition. This is retrieved and placed into a field kit container upon request. The gun is left alone, per request from Control. Subject examines more of the bunker, focusing on a desk where a newspaper has been cut and is in good condition. The clipped articles are recovered using a field kit container. Little else of interest to be brought back is in the bunker, as the camera is panned around. Trash bags containing clothing, a few children's toys resembling popular 1950s era products are lined against the wall. Subject is requested to leave the bunker and then sharply asked to wait by a control technician who directs the camera view to an area near the exiting doorway to the hatch. Closer inspection as subject moves in finds that a small area has been fitted with what appears to be an ethernet jack, the cover of which has been forced slightly away from the wall by a strange amber-like substance. Subject refuses to touch or collect a sample, commenting that it stinks so bad that if they want it they can come get it themselves. Control declines and subject leaves bunker. As subject grips ladder to leave, the camera pans up for a moment, and at the top of the tunnel, a humanoid figure is seen peering down. Control asks subject to confirm figure. Subject states nothing is up there, and begins to climb. Figure draws out of camera view after first rung is touched by subject, who ascends without incident. At the top of the tunnel, no other life is seen. Nothing has been disturbed. Subject insists nothing was there and closes the hatch, then immediately vomits. Subject coughs and uses a supplied water bottle to gargle, then freezes and asks if Control is hearing that. Control reports no audio. Subject approaches cellar hatch cautiously with firearm drawn and lifts her head just enough so camera can view outside area. 
In the distance, approximately 700 meters from the farm, two massive humanoid beings are crawling across the landscape. The entities do not notice the subject, who remains quiet, but whose drawn sidearm is visibly trembling. Subject requested to remain still and silent as beings move. They are featureless, facing at an angle moving across the field of vision so the faces are only visible for a few moments. During this time, it is clear they have no facial features. The arms they use to drag themselves are short at times and long at others, stretching out to varying lengths each time they move. There is no rear area to the beings. All bodily design appears to end at the torso. The two creatures take approximately 10 minutes to disappear into the distance before the subject begins to panic and begs to return. Request declined. Subject instructed to enter the home from the cellar and not to leave the home under any circumstances. The first floor is entered through a hatch in the ceiling or floor that opens with rusty creaks that cause subject to pause for 37 seconds before continuing upward and entering a kitchen. A heavy layer of dust coats all items in the kitchen. The refrigerator is left open. All food is spoiled. Adjacent the kitchen is a living area that subject enters slowly. There is a recliner, a couch, and a television, all of 1950s style design. In the recliner is a laptop whose case also resembles 1950s decor and is coated in heavy dust. Opening the laptop reveals the last moments of its operating system, Faithful OS, leaving a standby mode and immediately shutting off. Laptop has no external power source and will not power back on. When asked to recover laptop, it brings the cushion of the recliner with it, the two stuck together. Subject advised to leave laptop where it is. The inside door leaving the home is nailed shut with thick wood planks. No attempts made to interact with these. Camera view pans to a staircase leading upstairs. Subject ascends the stairs without being asked, and the stairs remain silent to control surprise. When subject reaches top of stairs, a hallway with two doors is viewed, one on each side, and at the end of the hall, a dumbwaiter is inlaid into the wall. Subject opens door on left on her own, which opens to a master bedroom. The bed is neatly made, but the wardrobe next to it is thrown open, and clothes are everywhere on the floor. Subject finds laid out on the bed several pieces of jewelry and is informed to leave them. Subject begins to protest, then comments they stink and leaves them alone, promptly leaving the room. Subject asks to open second door. The second door opens and gives a view of a shared children's bedroom, obviously boy and girl given the types of toys and clothes scattered on the floor. There is also a window, which subject approaches and wipes with a curtain to clear dust. Subject requested to move camera to window and does so. The farmland is visible and approximately 40 kilometers from it, at best guess, a city. As the camera starts to draw back, it pans down and films the area around the house. Approximately 300 figures, similar to those from the footage captured during blue test, are visible around the home, all staring up. Subject asks to confirm figures, but states nothing is there. Subject requested to return and quickly agrees. Egress from the house is uneventful. Pulley system shows no erratic behavior. As subject returns to point of pulley wire's origin, a loud groaning noise causes the picture to reverberate. Technicians at control report they were also able to hear the noise and experienced the vibration. Subject returns through point of origin without investigation and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 relinquished. Video ends. Return to newspaper fragments filed as The next test is classified as the Violet Test. Item Number SCP-133 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures All instances of SCP-133 are stored in their original shipping crates, which are to be stored within a standard safe class storage container at Site-19. Experimentation with SCP-133 may only be performed with prior written permission from at least two Level 4 personnel. Description: SCP-133 are a set of 613 black, circular pieces of a waxy, paper-like material, 5 centimeters in diameter. When placed against a solid surface and rubbed, 
SCP-133 will instantaneously transfer to the surface and create a circular hole. Testing has shown that SCP-133 is capable of penetrating up to 61 centimeters of structural grade steel, though the exact degree of penetration is reduced by extremely smooth or highly dense materials. Examination of holes created by SCP-133 show that they are superficially smooth, but exhibit tool marks consistent with that of extremely fine boring implements at a microscopic level. The exact mechanism by which SCP-133 operates is still under investigation. SCP-133 came to the Foundation's attention following a string of high-profile burglaries in the city of Suppressed surveillance footage and forensic evidence were brought to the attention of embedded Foundation agents and local law enforcement agencies, and upon attempting to apprehend the culprit, subject placed an instance of SCP-133 over his chest and data expunged. Local law enforcement officers were administered Class A amnestics and released. The original shipping crate in which SCP-133 was found has been shown to be immune to SCP-133's effect, despite being composed of ordinary wood. It has been incorporated into the containment procedures for SCP-133. Addendum 13301 Shipping label found within SCP-133 Instant Holes Trademark A product of the factory 800 units Item Number SCP-162 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-162 is to be kept in a sealed steel container at all times. Any handling is to be done with thick steel plate gloves and heavy body armor. Any personnel attempting to touch SCP-162 without proper protection or acting in an erratic or non-responsive manner are to be immediately removed from the containment area. All personnel are to submit to mental testing and review for two weeks after interaction with SCP-162. Description SCP-162 is a mass of fish hooks, fish line, needles, scissors, and other sharp objects in a rough ball shape, close to 2.4 meters, or 8 feet, in width, and 2.1 meters, or 7 feet, in height. After being in SCP-162's vicinity, subjects have reported feeling drawn to the object in order to touch it. This desire can extend for several weeks after seeing the item, becoming an obsession in many cases. The draw increases the more SCP-162 is observed, and subjects will become violent towards anyone attempting to restrain or remove them from SCP-162. Touching SCP-162 will immediately result in several hooks becoming embedded in the subject's skin. The experience is extremely painful much more so than normal fishhooks. Struggling or attempting to escape will ensnare the subject more, likely resulting in the subject's complete entrapment on the surface of SCP-162. Subject will bleed profusely, resulting in death after a prolonged period of time. Subjects whose skin is impenetrable to SCP-162's fishhooks, such as SCP-1063, have proven to be immune to SCP-162's compulsion effects. Attempting to remove a subject from SCP-162 will result in the entrapment of the remover, or gross bodily harm to the subject's flesh. Subjects will many times cycle between expressing extreme pain and requesting assistance, to statements of pleasure and requests to be left alone, even attempting to grab an entangled personnel attempting to rescue them. Activation of SCP-1114 within the proximity of SCP-162 has proven to be an effective means of freeing a subject from entrapment, though SCP-162's compulsion effect still remains. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.